And this is the People Power Lunch Hour Show. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about organizing in your communities beyond the elections. So we are featuring two organizers in the first half who are going to be talking about organizing around health care and economic and social justice. And in the second half, we will talk to somebody who is an organizer around immigrants' rights. We're going to be featuring the organizations of the People First campaign, the Poor People's campaign, and New Sanctuary Movement. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of the People Power Lunch Hour Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour Show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. And today's topic is all about long-term organizing here in the Philadelphia and South Jersey area. Uh, In the election, we had record numbers of people go out to vote, and there's a lot of momentum for people being civically engaged. But here at Philly Cam, we want to talk about being engaged with your communities and taking action beyond the ballot box. So we are going to be focusing this month's theme on long-term organizing. That is all the work that happens throughout the year that creates and builds social movements. The two issues that voters mentioned at the exit polls that were of their biggest concern were the economy and health care. So today, in the first half hour, we are going to be featuring two organizers with the Poor People's Campaign and also um, another organization, Put People First PA. And in the second half hour, we will talk to somebody from the New Sanctuary Movement. I want to welcome my guests to the show, two amazing women who have been organizing here in our area for a really long time. Uh, I want to welcome Kristen Nicely Colangelo. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? And Nijbi Zarenko. Thank you so much for having me. And you're both involved in the Poor People's Campaign. And Nijmi, you're also involved in the Put People First PA organization. That's right. So uh, we're here to inform our listeners and viewers out there and let them know how they can get involved in some of these issues that they care about. And as we know, elections aren't the only way that we create social change, right? We take to the streets. We educate people and we build movements. So I'd love to talk to you both about those things. So if you're unfamiliar with the Poor People's Campaign, it is a nationwide movement with local chapters. And so Kristen is part of the New Jersey chapter. There's one in Philadelphia. They're all over the United States. Their website is poorpeoplescampaign.org. And on their website, it says that this campaign is based on the fundamental principles dedicated to moral analysis based on our deepest religious and constitutional values that demand justice for all. And that a moral revival is necessary to save the heart and soul of the American democracy. Some of their demands um, listed in their Declaration of Fundamental Rights and the Poor People's Moral Agenda Uh, include demands around poverty and inequality, systemic racism, national morality, war and militarism, and ecological devastation. So that's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell us a little bit how you both got involved in this movement and what attracted you to it. Sure. You (laughs) Nidge me. Nidge me. Okay, thank you. Well, it's funny because Kristen and I both um, emerged um, and are connected to um, organizing that goes back many, many years, um, poor people's organizing, uh, a history that's not often taught in this country, actually, um, of poor people's organizing, going back to um, Reconstruction, going back to um, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, going back to the Bonus Army, uh, going back to the original Poor People's Campaign. Um, and so the homeless union was uh, something that existed in the United States in the 80s, 
had 20,000 members in cities across this country. And one of our mentors, uh, Willie Baptist, uh, was a founder of that work. And in 2005, um, at the, at, in Union Theological Seminary, this program was started called the Poverty Initiative. And that program was designed to bring together uh, leaders in poor people's organizations throughout the country and network us and get us talking to each other, get us building relationships, studying together um, both sort of political economy and liberation theology. And so that's how we came to know each other. And so that 10-year process or more really that started at, at um, Poverty Initiative, which became the Cairo Center, which is now one of the co national co-convening organizations of the Poor People's Campaign. Mm -hmm. So you can see some of the genesis that's kind of gotten us to this point, the Cairo Center, and then also the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina, which was also a 10-year movement with Reverend Barber, um, and the Cairo Center with Reverend Liz, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and those are the two national co-chairs. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of history that goes behind um, the Poor People's Campaign. Kristen, when I first met you, you had told me that you used to travel around uh, organizing out of your car <laughs> and working with people and doing yes. a lot of work involved in the HIV AIDS movement, which mm -hmm. um, I learned later on that was heavily um, centered here in Philadelphia yeah. in West Philly. Um, how has your work evolved since then into, uh, you know, doing the work that you do now? The last time I ran into Kristen, she was in the Trenton State House <laughs> um, with the Poor People's Campaign <laughs> um, out in the annex area, um, leading some chants, speaking out, and, and people were getting arrested. Screaming into a bullhorn, I think we were doing. Yes, that was an exciting day. And uh, I'm really excited to be here, especially with one of my strong sisters in the struggle. I'm, I'm excited. Um, and I'm so happy that you brought up history. History is such a, a central theme in the work that we do. And um, I'm still traveling all around, um, often in my car. Sometimes I get to fly now. Um, but in the campaign, we are still building a lot of homeless um, committees and homeless unions. And Nijmi mentioned the homeless union, which is still central to, to what I do. Um, the Homeless Union History Project is um, what I coordinate now, and uh, that builds on the homeless union that started in the late 80s and early 90s, and I was very honored to be part of that as a teenager. My mother was part of that. And that led into um, the work where you met me was also professionally and organizing. It's the same was the movement around HIV led to a lot of health care issues, a lot of homelessness, and a lot of death, as you know. Um, also a social justice health care issue. Um, and the organizing I was doing at that time in Philadelphia led out of Kensington um, and statewide, going around that time, um, building statewide as they're doing and put people first, which Nismi will talk about, but nationwide as well. Um, and this Homeless Union History Project is building committees with put people, um, I'm so, I always do that. Okay. Poor People's Campaign, um, put people first comes out of my mouth often first. Um, the Poor People's Campaign, building homeless committees, but then also other groupings around the country, building homeless unions again, leaders that were in the original homeless union. Um, Willie Baptist, our mentor, as well as Savina Martin is in California, Tony Prince is in California, um, Savina Martin's in Boston, Tony Prince is in California, and other leaders across the country that are organizing again around the increasing numbers of families that are becoming homeless, children. Um, and it's very interesting, one of the organizations, as you talked about in the Poor People's Campaign, is uh, the Fight for 15. And we're seeing this connection between those that are out there fighting for um, minimum wage uh, being increased and the fight for 15 are also the same people that are in the homeless union because they can't afford to live, right? There is not one county in the country where you can afford a home on minimum wage. That's right. And that's a travesty. That is a disgusting travesty in what we call the richest country in the world. That's right. So that is what we've come together around for decades Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a teenager when this started. So we're coming together to, you know, the campaign that you saw when we re reconnected was to build um, awareness. These are mobilizations. Right. And then after huge mobilizations where you bring people together, you then you have to do the organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when you sit together and you do this education and you have these conversations about why. Why are we discussing militarism connected with poverty, connected with systemic racism? How are they connected? And really doing that 
political education. And that's what's the cornerstone of Put People First, the Boston group, the California group. And that's what is really the, the heartbeat of what we're doing. Can I just um, build on that? Because that was really wonderful. And because we kind of situated with some history about poor people's organizing, I just want to say, um, kind of dispel some myths I think people have about um, who is poor, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, we live in a country, um, the richest country in the world. Um, sometimes that's a shock to folks because when we look around, what do we see? Um, and what are we actually experiencing? And then what we know in the Poor People's Campaign is that it's 140 million people in this country who are poor or near poor, meaning that they couldn't withstand a $400 emergency bill. And so we're talking about the homeless union and what you know they learned out of that process. These were workers, right? These were yes. folks who were used used to be in unions, used to um, you know be workers. Uh, it's not a stereotypical perception, right? The 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 place of folks who are struggling today is the future for for all of us, actually, right? Which we need to understand the direction that this country is going in, um, and it's 140 million people which is almost half of the US population. So it's not a small group, it's not a sort of marginalized community, it's not just one community, it cuts across all communities. So when we're talking about these four evils and how they're interconnected, mm -hmm. poverty, systemic racism, environmental devastation, and militarism, we can't solve one of those problems without solving all of those problems. And that's why the Poor People's Campaign is taking that on and trying to build a mass movement um, to do that. Yeah, I think part of that uh, education is around intersectionality, right? And, mm -hmm. and understanding oh. all the different uh, movements and why we need to support one another, even if, you know, I might be working on climate change and yes. you're working on housing and you're working on healthcare, that they're all rooted in the same causes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is, you know, the foundation of how our country was built and how wealth is transferred, right? Because I think we're really talking about the growing gap and the divide uh, between the very, very rich and the poor. Yes. And you know what we often characterize as income inequality. But it's more than just income inequality, right? Because right. it's a lot of the income is, is not even earned, right? Um, That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to educate people about how land and um, other assets are, are transferred um, through generations. And so there are very few people who are self-made billionaires. There's a few out there. <laughs> but most of the wealth here has, has been controlled by a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And our population is growing. And that number is also growing. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, talk about um, you know, why you think it's important to educate people uh, over a longer period of time. So one of one of the central lessons from the homeless union, it's very important to look at history. And uh, we talk a lot about the successes of the homeless union, but it did end. Um, and to look at the demise, and one of the demise um, lessons from that was that Dignity Housing in Philadelphia came out of the homeless union, and 200 people were housed. And that was amazing, until they really looked at um, the analysis of um, one, where the houses they got came from, and that was foreclosures on other people, and how many people had become homeless in the time that they had gotten the homes, and it was an, a, a, a huge number. So housing somebody does not you know, address homelessness. H homelessness is a result. It is not the cause, right? Um, and they really learned that their analysis of the problem wasn't deep enough. They, they were looking at the leaves. They weren't looking at the roots. Right, and they needed to write. They need to become root doctors, is what we talk about a lot. And political education, long term, mm -hmm. deep, continued political education, gets at that. And that was one of the main lessons that came out of the Black Panther movement. Has political education was very central. The unions the were really unions, good at that. Yes, right. So. Um, Political education and studying, really studying other social movements, studying political economy, political history. We talked about Reconstruction. We talked about slavery. That was the biggest poor people's movement we've ever seen in this country was when the slaves began to run away. And, and that was, they were stealing themselves. They were property. 
and looking at that and looking at history and other social movements and looking at really looking at political economy in this country. And it's, it's central because if you don't know who the enemy is and you look, you're just looking at the leaves, you're not looking at the root cause. You know, I always say, and I've always said this, and it's, it's you know, really what I start a lot of our, our discussions with. If you have an incorrect analysis of a problem, any solution that you base, you know, any solution you base on that incorrect analysis is doomed to fail. So we keep putting these, these, these programs and these, these incorrect, you know, solutions but we're not really getting to the root cause and we have to discuss that. Yeah, like raking the forest fire, right? Like yes. that's, that's not a very great solution. <laughs> not a solution. root solution. It's right. not. Great example in today's current time. We, yes. we talk a lot about um, building the four C's, which is clear, competent, committed, and connected yes. leaders. So to this whole point, what you're raising, Vanessa, of long-term organizing, it rests on clear, competent, committed, and connected leaders. And really... Um, given the, the no enormity of our task, one of our main victories is building such leaders mm -hmm. and crafting everything that we do in order to build leaders. Yeah. And I think that's a lesson coming out of our work, out of Put People First. The Poor People's Campaign is um, how do we make everything we do about building leaders? Yeah. Because organizations, you know, or organizations and different efforts and mobilizations happen, but we need to make sure that people come out of those efforts ready to take on the next thing and very, like, in deep relationship with a clear strategy um, and really able to, um, to operationalize that strategy, right? Yes. Um, because if we're talking about human development, not just sort of moving bodies and telling people where to go and what to do. So when we come back, we're going to talk more about building leaders and some of the strategies that Put People First PA uses to create this army of people that are fighting back. Uh, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour show at Philly Cam and on WPPM 106.5 FM. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk more with Kristen and Nijmi. And later on in the show, we'll feature Blanca Pancheco, who is with the New Sanctuary Movement. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Philly Cam offers classes for people who want to create their own content and shows. To get started, there are three steps you must follow. Step 1. Attend a free info session. Step 2. Become a member. Step 3. Attend a members only intro to community media, TV, and your radio workshop. To learn more about Philly Cam workshops and info sessions, visit phillycam.org. Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour Show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're here at Philly Cam in the WPPM studios, and we are talking about long-term organizing this month on our show because we want people to get involved in their communities beyond just voting in the elections. There's a lot to do building up to 2020, and so that's why we do this show. We're also trying to educate people and get them more connected to organizations. One of the things we discovered in the 2016 election was that people really realized how important um, you know, our rights are and what's at stake, and they wanted to do something about it. But people really didn't know, and not all people, you know, some people, they didn't know where to begin. You know? And I actually had a conversation with somebody recently who was a, a friend of a family member, and the first thing she said was, things are so bad, this is really intolerable, I, I wanna go to a march or something. And I said, marches are great. That's a great place to meet people. But really, like the first thing you should be doing is sort of educating yourself about what the issues that you care about 
and then maybe trying to find some organizations, you know, that you can maybe get involved with that working on those issues. And she said to me, well, I'm, op I'm, I'm open to it. You know, I, I vote it. <laughs> and again, it's clear that there's still a lot of education around how people participate in a social movement. And so I think Put People First is a great organization for people to sort of uh, take a look at because you have what I call kind of like a training program, right? Uh, there's ways, there's like steps to this, right? So talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you get people involved. And again, if you're unfamiliar with Put People First, they're all about, you know, claiming their rights to health care and believing that people should get the care that they need when they need it without going broke. And their long-term goal is to pass legislation that ensures health care is universal, publicly financed human right for everyone in Pennsylvania. And some of the things that uh, you do is organizing the unorganized, education and action, uh, believing that every everyday people, not experts, are the leaders. Um, so talk a little bit how you transform them into leaders. Thanks, Vanessa. I love how you did all your homework. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, that's great. Um, yeah, so I just want to say, um, you know, thank you and put people first. Um, we started six years ago, and it really just came out of, again, like lessons, right? Like, how do we do something different? Um, how do we really um, build... Uh, leaders and do it in a statewide way, right? And so one of the things we share with the Poor People's Campaign is this whole idea that it's not about left and right, it's about right and wrong, right? And so we don't see any parts of Pennsylvania as throwaway parts. We don't see any parts as not being important, as not being, as not mattering, right? We're, we are building in rural communities, in small towns, in suburban areas, and in cities, and we strongly believe that in order to actually change what's politically possible, we we need all of those regions and people in all those regions coming together. So we can't discount anyone. We can't throw anyone away. And you all are nonpartisan. I like the part that I read that says we hold all leaders accountable no matter what party. And I feel the same way as a journalist, you know, like, no, it's safe. We're gonna <laughs> That's right. We got to hold everybody accountable. We really do. We really have to hold all power holders accountable. That's one of our core values. And so in terms of developing leaders, you know, when you, your anecdote about, right, like folks who kind of want to take one action, it's, that's very important. But we, what we try to do is to make a space for people to build a political home. And in order to do that, really, people have to be in long-term relationship with each other. They have to come together on a regular basis so that they can learn, so that they can build relationships, and that they can take action, right? So a lot of times I think what we find is like people take action, a big group of people come together for a moment in time, and then they disperse, right? You don't really know anyone other than the people you came with. You're not really involved necessarily in a, in a vision, a long-term way. So it's not, again, those mobilizations have their place but we believe that the organization of the working class and when we say working class what we mean is anyone who's in that fundamental relationship right to the people who own and control the economy we don't own and control it right we're the people who are forced to sell our labor are forced to work and some of us are are doing care work right some of us are caring for people at home that's all working class right it's not just people who are employed um, we believe that to build the power of the working class, our power is our organization, right? It's expressed through our organization. It's expressed through our unity. And our unity can be only be built through organization. So Put People First aims to be a vehicle to really build that unity and that power of the working class and healthcare is a really powerful way to do that because it affects everyone, right? Everybody is impacted by it. So it's not, um, we're not a single issue in just like, oh, we care about healthcare, we don't care about all these other things. Actually, what we're trying to do is bring people together and healthcare is a vehicle for doing that and it touches on every single aspect of life because really we know that just like we can't solve racism without poverty and poverty without racism we can't solve healthcare without also addressing all the social determinants of health which touches on every aspect of inequality and exploitation that exists so it's really this microcosm that allows us to bring lots of different mm -hmm. people together and find their common ground 
while also recognizing their differences. Some of the things that you require people to do, you know, if they want to become a member, they have to attend a monthly call, they have to uh, volunteer on a campaign, they have to contribute to a blog, serve on a committee. What? <laughs> you looked at our membership form. Awesome. Well, because we too, you know, require that same of our um, on-air staff here um, at WPPM. You know, it's it's a way for us to have a democratic, yes, uh, you know, governance model. That's because right. When I worked in commercial radio, we didn't have any say in the decision making or the programming at all, and I always found this to be unfair, especially as a as a woman, as a Puerto Rican woman. I, this is. This is unfair. Right. And so, again, we have to kind of lead by example That's in right. terms of, like, the kind of governance model you like to see. So we believe here in participatory democracy. That's right. But along with that, you have certain responsibilities. So I just want people to just really understand, like, what, what it takes, you know, in, in to, to be in a, in actively involved in a social movement with a group to be held accountable but also along the way to be a leader and to be empowered. Right. And we're at the point now with Put People First, I'm proud to say, because, you know, it's been a struggle. It hasn't been easy to build a statewide organization, you know, um, built 95% on volunteers, including myself. And so, but we know that, like, we're never going to be in 67 counties if we're only relying on paid staff to sort of orchestrate everything. We've got to actually build everyday people who are committing to this process because they believe in it so strongly. And so I think we're at the point now where we've got committees throughout the state that are actually led by people who live in those communities Mm -hmm. and they're directing it. And they've gone from in one year, we're sort of at this point where like if you come in and you really you want it and you're like, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to be active and I'm going to learn and I'm going to do stuff in the course of a year. Right. People are now running their own committees right across the state. So it's it's really incredible. Um, But again, right, it does take it's very it has to take a methodical process. I think some people hear that and they're like, well, I don't have time for all that, you know. And there are a lot of people who play different roles. It's not to say like, you know, you must give it an X amount of time in order to be part of the organization. Actually, it's a it's a mass organization. It's open to everyone. People do what they can, right? It's a principle, right? You give what you can and get what you need, right? And so, um, you know, there's a lot of levels of participation, but what we find is that actually um, people, many people want to actually get more and more and more engaged once they start to, um, you know, build those relationships, understand the strategy and the theory of change. And I think that's one of the things that you're speaking to. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's a different ball game when everyone in the organization understands the strategy is, is actually involved in it. Right. Right. And is plotting the course for the next year, which is what we're doing now. We have a campaign plan, um, that we crafted out of our membership assembly, right? Everyone came together. We had a conversation, Um, We took all the feedback, and now that plan is going out to every single body in the organization so that everyone has input in it, and then we'll come together and ratify it. And that's the internal democracy, right? Because we are trying to do something different than the system that we currently have, and we've got to to manifest that in our organizations. Yeah, Kristen, do you have um, something to add in terms of, like, the way people get involved in uh, the Poor People's Campaign, if there's... Folks out there in South Jersey, because WPPM reaches Camden County, and they say, you know what, I want to get involved. Where do they go? Like, what are some of the first steps uh, uh, for people to join you? In, excuse me, in South Jersey and all across New Jersey, there is a Facebook page. There's also a website um, for the Poor People's Campaign. You can get involved. It is across the state from south all the way to Atlantic City, all the way up to North Jersey. We have representation is split into regions. Once you get on the website and you sign up, you will get, um, we have tri-chairs in New Jersey because we have the three regions. Of course, you always have South Jersey, Central Jersey, and North Jersey. Um, And the tri-chair from that uh, part of the state will reach out. And uh, we have things 
that go on in each one of those regions because the state is very different. It's like Pennsylvania, right? The state is very different. So one of those tri-chairs will reach out or somebody from that part of the state, and they have things that are going on in different parts of the state. And I know that in the in the South, there's a lot of focus right now on the addiction and the, the overdose and the, you know, the opiate crisis. And I know in the North, there's a lot of focus on climate and um, some of the, the um, food, water um, work that's going on in the North. So I know that there's, and in, in the Central, there's been a lot of immigrant work. So I know that each part of the state has different movements, but there's movements across the whole state for different, um, all of the, the, um, the areas of the, the movement. But I know that each part of the state has different things that they're focusing on. So if you get involved, that those people that are in that part of the state will reach out. Um, and then the, you can always um, go on and, and you can get in touch with me through you. If people want to just get in touch with the radio station, you can always get in touch with me. I'm on the, the coordinating committee, um, very involved with the political education, but I also am involved with the tri-chairs. People can get in touch with me through you, through the radio station. Um, people can also get involved, as I said, through our Facebook page. It's New Jersey Poor People's Campaign. They can also go to the Poor People's Campaign Facebook page. Um, and I'm also involved with Put People First, so you can always get in, um, in touch with us, Nijmi and myself, through Put People First. Yeah, so um, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to talk a little bit about direct action, because I do a segment on another show that's called mm -hmm. Direct Action Gets the Goods, and <laughs> I like to highlight... Um, Anytime people, you know, get their demands met or make progress on a campaign through direct action, because I think it's important to let people know that, you know, a lot of times change does come a after some of these actions. You just don't hear about it. It's not highlighted in the mainstream media. The Poor People's Campaign has been very busy this year. Yeah. Uh, you all marched all the way to Washington, D.C., and have been really active in the state capitals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and why that's an effective strategy? Sure. So, Can, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, um, because you were talking about the New Jersey campaign mm -hmm. for Pennsylvania, um, we, uh, and across the country, right, 40 states, there was this um, mm -hmm. season of nonviolent civil disobedience. And... In PA, um, 1,500 people participated in that. There were um, 76 folks who did civil disobedience and actually got arrested um, over the course of the 40 days between Mother's Day and June 23rd. Um, and it across the country, um, what historians are telling us is the largest wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in history, um, and certainly in this century. And... Um, we did that because we wanted to like we wanted to do something together in a synchronized way across the entire country. We like to talk about one band, one sound, right? And so it was also showing that, um, like you're saying, direct action is critical, right? And we wanted to kind of get ourselves in gear. There will be more of that, right? There needs to be more of it. It's absolutely essential. Um, it shows our commitment. Um, it shows our commitment to nonviolence because everything that we do is nonviolent. Um, but it also shows that you can be incredibly powerful, you can be incredibly serious, and also nonviolent. Um, and so I just wanted to um, say, yes, we're incredibly committed to direct action. Um, it is an in incredibly important part of our strategy. And um, also Pennsylvania has a Facebook page, Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. I would encourage everybody to go to poorpeoplescampaign.org, mm -hmm. read the national demands, um, and also the audit, the souls of poor folk, mm -hmm. which actually has the data behind everything that we're talking about. Systemic racism, poverty, militarism, and environmental devastation, and really what are the situations and how do they affect all kinds of communities in this country. Um, so the audit, the souls of poor folk, and also the national demands can both be found on poorpeoplescampaign.org. And in Pennsylvania, you can also check out our um, Pennsylvania Facebook page. I want to give a shout out to a mutual friend of ours, Kyle Moore, who's a regular here. <laughs> People power he lunch says hour. hello. <laughs> he, uh, he has a blog. I, I'm sure if you got, uh, Google Kyle Moore, um, He's been tracking a lot of these. That's part of like his research is going all over the country 
And just by following him alone, you can see how active people are in the last two years. And it really has been a really great thing to see. And I just want to tell our listeners and viewers out there, if you see people sitting in or blocking traffic, don't be scared of them. These are people that really, really care. And that's what I find with people that are willing to put their bodies on the line. Like these people really care about their fellow human beings so much so that they will risk arrest and put their bodies on the line. So I always stop and kind of say like, thank you, uh, you know, for, for doing that. And, you know, I, people just have to be aware that if they are going to get involved in or organizations, they don't have to do direct action But that is sort of going to be part of the experience, right? Sure. And Dr. King said, Martin Luther King said, you know, normally we stop at stop signs, right? I mean, that's the law and we stop because it's the law and it makes things go. But if there's an ambulance coming through and there's an emergency situation and someone's bleeding out and dying in the back of the ambulance, they have the right to go through the stop sign or the red light because it's an emergency. And we have an emergency in this country today. And so there's going to be some stop lights and some stop signs that we have to go through to call attention to that and to solve the problems and to prevent the bleeding and to stop the bleeding. I would argue the stop signs themselves are illegal, but (laughs) can I... So in New Jersey, as you know, and and I'm sure Kyle talked about this, we were one of two states where the structures of the state, the police, blocked us from going into a state building, which is violating our rights. So in New Jersey, we, we were arrested before we even went into the building. So historically, the structures of the state are used and laws are written to uphold the, the ruling class of structure. And we're, we're doing a study right now of history right after Reconstruction when laws are put into place to tie people back to the land after slavery ended. So there are often, you know, we really have to look at that laws are unjust. Mm-hmm. And you That's only right. have one choice when laws are unjust, right. and that is to break them. <laughs> All right. You heard it here <laughs> on the People Power Lunch Hour <laughs> show. Um, But really, again, it's another thing that you should research and read about. I think that's another thing that's not taught in schools. It's probably a a bad idea from their perspective to teach students how to organize and stand up for their rights and uh, engage in civil disobedience, which is why they don't learn about it, right? But um, there's a lot of history there. There's there's so many great international movements Mm -hmm. all over the world. I love reading about movements in Central and South America, huge student movements there. Um, and also in France, the you know, it's been a lot of big protests yeah, with Haiti. workers. Yeah, yeah, all over the world. And so I would encourage all of you to read more about that. So I want to thank both of you for the thank work you. that you do for you. spreading knowledge and awareness and for inviting the public to join you yes. in this fierce campaign. Uh, can you each uh, tell us, tell our listeners how they can find more information um, by giving the websites? Sure. So poorpeoplescampaign.org, you can go there to sign up and you'll start receiving information immediately. You can also go to putpeoplefirstpa.org as well if you're interested in Put People First PA. All right. Thank you, Kristen and Nijmi. Uh, We're going to take a short break here on the People Power Lunch Hour show. And when we come back, we'll talk with uh, somebody from the New Sanctuary Movement. And we're going to talk about long-term organizing around immigrants rights stay tuned to the people power lunch hour on philly cam tv and wppm 106.5 fm